the last part of this series, I showed you how I improved the performance of my LOD pellet. Although the FPS was quite beautiful, the same cannot be said for the surface of the planet. At every point where cuts of different detail levels met, there were cracks. This was because the less detailed, i.e. larger points, lacked the vertices needed to match up with the more detailed, i.e. smaller quads. This was quite a tricky problem to solve, but I think I've finally done it using a little thing called edge fans. My name is Simon Honkvist and this is LOD Planets Episode 3. So what exactly are edge fans? Well, I got the idea from a very interesting talk given by the developers of Kerbal Space Program at Unite 2013. As they explain in the talk, edge fans are a way for vertices of higher detail quads to line up with those of the lower detail quads at the edges. This makes them merge together and removes the cracks entirely from the planets. But for this to work, each quad has to be aware of what quads are next to it, i.e. its neighbors, to be able to adapt accordingly. Such a task happens to be much more difficult to do efficiently than one might expect, but the KSP devs found a solution. Well, they did, but they only explained one half of it in the talk. All they said was that they used a bit mask to find the correct neighbor with no further explanation as to how. So it was time for me to figure out how to do it, but I eventually did. Let's visualize a quad that we then divide into four new quads. These quads are then assigned a number based on their position relative to their parent quad, the first quad. The northwest quad becomes zero, the northeast quad becomes one, the southeast quad becomes two, and the southwest quad becomes three. The use of cardinal directions will lessen the confusion later. So just bear with me. Let's divide quad number one into four new quads called 10, 11, 12, and 13. Notice that they inherit their parent's position and append their own. So, how do we find the south neighbor of, let's say, quad number 013? Well, first we have to define what south neighbor really means. Does it mean more than just position? The answer is yes. Let's imagine this data structure as an infinitely tall skyscraper, with each LOD being one floor, whose amount of rooms increases exponentially the further up you get. You play the role of the algorithm, and start at the first floor containing only one room. To simplify things a bit, let's only show the rooms that you have entered. You want to get to room 013, so you start by going up one floor and entering the northwest room. You then take the stairs in that room up to the next floor, where you take the northeast room. Finally, you walk up the stairs to the fourth floor and enter the southwest room. You are now in room 013. Now, how do you get the number of the room directly south of yours? Let's think about how we got here in the first place. The main purpose of the room number is to guide you to that room, so the path that you take must have had some significance. You decide to ask the owner of the building for some help and she gives you the correct room number of your south neighbor, which is room 020. You ask her how she knew and this is what she tells you. Well, think about the path that you took to get to your room and compare to the path that one must take to get to room 020. The first step is the same, enter the northwest room once you get to the second floor. But after that, the instructions are inverted. South becomes north and east becomes west. Thus, a 1 becomes a 2 and a 3 becomes a 0. The reason for this sudden change is that reading from right to left, the one in 013 is the first time the one needs to go something other than south. 
That's why one is the last number that is flipped. If you want to find your north neighbor, you will just flip until you got a two or three. Given that such a room exists, of course. That's it. That's the key. On screen now are some visualizations of this algorithm seen from different perspectives. Don't worry if this is a little confusing, it took me days to arrive at this answer. The important thing is that it works, so let's just get through the code and hope that things become a little clearer as we go. I only need to check for two neighbors of a given quad. Because two of the quad sides are always facing another quad with the same parent quad, which means that it can't have a lower detail level. If it did, it will simply not fit within the same parent chunk. Those two sides are selected by simply defining which corner a given quad is at its creation, and then running through a few if statements to select and investigate the correct neighbors. The neighbor detail level detection is done in a method called check neighbor LOD, which takes in two values, one for the side and one for the hash value. The side is simply on which side the currently investigated neighbor is in relation to the first quad. The hash value, on the other hand, is a little trickier to explain, but not by much. It's simply the room number that is generated at the quad's creation. But it's important to remember one key thing about the room number. You might have noticed how I pronounced each digit in the room number slash hash value separately. Instead of saying 12, I said 1, 2. This must not mislead you into believing that the room number is in base 10. In actuality, the room number is in base 4. This allows us to represent the room number as a relatively short binary sequence. Let's take room 013 as an example. Using our implementation of the binary system, this will be 0001111. Well, in my code I actually begin all the room numbers with a 1 in binary, so that the zeros at the beginning are not lost making the binary number 1000011. Let's jump into the check neighbor LD method. In there we find a few variables, one of which is called bitmask. This bitmask will invert the hash values up to a certain point, which, because of the way that we number the quotes, will give us the correct path to the neighboring room. Then comes a loop that runs as many times as defined by the detail level. Near the start of the loop, store the two last bits of the binary number, i.e. the last digit in base 4. Then I add two zeros to the end of the bit mask by multiplying it by 4, which is 2, the base, to the power of 2, the number of zeros. I do this to make room for the next entry into the bit mask, which will be 1 1 if the neighbor is to the south, or 0 1 if the neighbor is to the north. Then I run a test to see if the two last bits correspond to a position on the opposite side of the parent quad. If it does, the loop is broken and the bit mask is finished. If that's not the case, the loop continues, leading us to its last line, which bit shifts the copy of the current quad's hash value two steps to the right, so that when the last two bits are selected a second time, they will correspond to the second digit in the base 4 number. That is, as I previously mentioned, counting from the right. That concludes the loop, so let's do something useful with a bit mask. We apply the bit mask to the hash value using the XOR operator which basically just inverts every bit that I want from the bitmask lines up with. Then, we pass the newly generated hash value alongside the detail level into a method called getNeighborDetailLevel. As you might guess, 
This method returns the data level of the neighbor which a lady used to determine whether a quad should have edge fence on a certain edge or not. The method starts at the top node of the node tree and then selects the child quad that corresponds to the last digit of the room number slash hash value. The method is then called on the child quad and one of its children is selected based on the second last digit of the room number. This pattern continues until a chunk with a hash value that corresponds to the requested one is found, at which point its data level is returned. If no quad with such a hash value is found, a data level of zero is returned, which ensures that the edge fans are created, since if the search for quad does not exist, the quad that occupies its space must be of a lower data level. So to recap, we find out which neighbors are interesting, then we generate a map to get to them, and lastly, we follow that map. If there is something about this process that you want me to explain, feel free to post a comment and I'll do my best to help. Now that we know when we want to edge fans, it's time to implement a way of actually adding them. I do this in a new script called presets, since the resolution of our edge fans will be determined by what graphic settings a user picks, and I thought it would be beneficial to separate user control code from behind the scenes stuff. When the game starts, 16 template quads are generated, one for each possible combination of edge fans, including a quad with no edge fans. The order of these is very important and I will explain why very soon. The template quads are generated procedurally using a variable called quadres to determine, you guessed it, the resolution. To reduce the amount of code that I needed to write, I simplified the template quads a bit. Every template quad has the same amount of vertices, even though most of them don't use every single one. This helps to simplify the triangle code because it makes vertex indices more uniform. I'm not going into too much detail on this because it's pretty much like adding a thousand random numbers together in math. It's not that hard to calculate, it just takes time. Feel free to copy and paste it from my GitHub repo in the description. Uh, just remember that the template quads are stored in two public static variables called quad template vertices and quad template triangles. Then I changed a lot inside the calculate vertices and triangles method. I ripped out the entire vertices and triangles generation code because we already make those inside the preset script. Instead, I scrapped the vertex and triangle data from the correct variables using an index that I generate with the information that I received about the neighboring quads. As I previously said, the order of the template quads is very important. This is because I want to know which index corresponds to which template quad. Because I know that, I can select one of the 16 template quads by interpreting the neighbor's array as a binary number. East has a value of 1, West has a value of 2, North has a value of 4, and South a value of 8. When the correct vertices and triangles have been selected, I use a transform matrix to move the quad to its correct position, as well as scale it and rotate it. The position and scale are calculated similarly to how I did it before, but the rotation is new. It is calculated using a lot of if-else statements at the top of the method that checks which side the sphere that the quad should be on, and then rotates it accordingly. Lastly, every vertex is normalized to make it look like a sphere again, and voila! That's about every major thing that I've implemented since the last episode. I've put a link to the GitHub repo in the description, as well as some other resources that you might find useful. I'm sorry that you had to wait so long for this episode, there was a lot that I needed to learn about matrices, bitwise operations and just mesh generation in general, but I think it paid off. The next video will bring some much needed visual improvements to the planet in the form of mountains and such things so make sure to stay tuned for that. As always, it really helps if you subscribe to the channel as well as hit the like button.
I've been amazed at the positive feedback that I've got from my previous videos, and I'm very much excited to bring you many more. Thank you all for watching. Goodbye.